For more physics related videos, please subscribe. In this video, I'm going to answer the question, does light, or do photons, have mass? I've rated the physics level in this video as easiest. The question of whether photons or light has mass is one of those ongoing debates that regularly comes up in physics departments and all over physics forums. Generally speaking, the debate takes place between two groups. One group claiming that photons are massless particles, the other group arguing that energy equals mass, and since photons have energy, they therefore have mass. Ultimately, we're going to see that this debate simply comes down to what do you mean by mass? The problem is, over the history of physics, many different terms have been used to refer to mass in one way or another, and these terms don't necessarily refer to the same quantity. In fact, it's rather complicated. Some of them are different terms for the same thing, and then some just refer to different quantities altogether. But all of them are referring to something that is sometimes called mass in one way or another. So in order to untangle this linguistic mess, we have to look at the history of mass, which predates even the history of Massachusetts. We start with Isaac Newton. Right from the start, Isaac Newton defines two different types of mass. One he calls the inertial mass, or just the inertia, and the other one he calls the gravitational mass. The inertial mass is what shows up in things like momentum, or force, and is often described as the thing that resists changes of motion. So the bigger the mass, or the bigger the inertia, the more difficult it is to change its motion. Alternatively, you can just think of this as the total amount of matter in an object. The gravitational mass is the mass that shows up in Newton's universal law of gravitation. This is the mass that is responsible for objects attracting one another via gravity. In principle, these two masses are not the same, but experimentally, they turn out to be the same, or at the very least, they're proportional to one another, meaning that if there is a difference between these two masses, it is small enough that nobody has been able to measure it. So even though we're starting off with two different definitions of mass, in practice, until somebody manages to measure a difference between the two, we only have one. Now this was the case in physics for a few hundred years after Newton, until Einstein came along and developed special relativity. This is where we get the famous equation E equals mc squared, or energy equals mass. So this is where the camp arguing that energy equals mass comes in. However, the theory of special relativity also pops out a different equation for energy, involving the rest mass and the momentum, which is P in this equation, where m naught signifies the rest mass of a particle. This is the mass a particle has if it's at rest. We'll get to this in more detail in a little bit. But photons, everyone agrees, have no rest mass. So this is where the camp arguing that photons are massless particles because they have no rest mass. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. On the face of it, these two equations don't seem to agree with one another. What is the difference between this mass, the rest mass, and this mass without the subscript zero? Well, this mass is the inertial mass. So now we have to figure out what is the difference between the inertial mass and the rest mass. We start off with this equation, m equals e over c squared. This is in fact the equation that Einstein first derived. He did not derive e equals mc squared, he derived m equals e over c squared, and in that derivation, he was specifically looking for the mass of a photon. And that's what he found, that the mass of a photon was equal to its energy divided by the speed of light squared. But at the time, the only mass he cared about was the inertial mass. There was no concept of rest mass yet. So in this equation, he found that the inertial mass of a photon is E over C squared, not the rest mass. And in fact, this equation for inertial mass holds for all particles, whether they have rest mass or not. So since then, this equation has been more famously written as E equals mc squared, where m is equal to the inertial mass of a particle. And as I said, this holds for all particles. Now we introduce this second expression for energy involving the rest mass, and since they're both equations for energy, they have to be equal to one another. Remember that P is the momentum of the particle. Now both of these equations hold for all particles. If you have a particle with no rest mass, like a photon, then this term drops out and you're left with E equals P times C, or energy equals momentum times the speed of light. 
Now in the case where the rest mass is not zero, this expression can also be written as gamma times m naught c squared, where gamma we get by just pulling out the m naught c squared from the square root. This quantity gamma is more commonly written as 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the velocity of the particle. All these expressions are equal to the energy, so this term gamma m naught c squared is equal to the energy of a particle that has a non-zero rest mass. Now putting all this together, since the inertial mass of an object is always e over c squared, we get that the inertial mass of a particle with non-zero rest mass is equal to gamma times m naught. Now even though this term is already called the inertial mass, it has been given a new name called the relativistic mass. This is just another name for inertial mass. And the important thing about this mass is that because it has this factor gamma in it, which depends on the velocity, the relativistic mass, or the inertial mass, in the theory of special relativity, now depends on how fast the object is going. It's not constant. Now we didn't notice this before because this factor gamma is very close to one until you start reaching speeds comparable to the speed of light. The problem now is that we have an inertial mass or a relativistic mass that's not constant. And physicists don't like quantities that aren't constant. We like things that don't change. They're easy to work with. So over the years, when dealing with relativity, the concept of inertial mass or relativistic mass has gone away. We don't use it anymore. It's not useful. Now we have to see how this new way of looking at mass fits with our original definitions from Newton. And it turns out we have to make a few modifications. So Newton is out and Einstein is in. And we now have a third type of mass called rest mass. Originally, we thought of the inertial mass as the amount of matter in an object but we just saw that the inertial mass changes with speed, so that doesn't make any sense. So this view of inertial mass doesn't work, and it turns out the rest mass is now the amount of matter in an object. The inertial mass was then changed to the relativistic mass, essentially to remind us that it changes with speed, but as I said, because it's not very useful, this term is outdated and not really used anymore. But you may occasionally run into it if you read some old papers. So what is the inertial mass now that we have special relativity? Well, we just saw what it is. It's basically just the energy. So we don't need a new name for it. It's no different from energy up to a factor of c squared. So why bother calling it mass in the first place? Let's just call it the energy. The rest mass, also sometimes called by another name, which is the proper mass. This term tends to be used by people dealing with gravity, which brings us to the next problem. Originally, we had that the inertial mass was experimentally no different from the gravitational mass. But now that we have rest mass as the amount of matter, how does the gravitational mass fit in? Can we still think of it as the inertial mass? Or is it the rest mass? Or is it some third quantity altogether? Well, when Einstein developed special relativity, he immediately realized that it was incompatible with Newton's law of gravity. So he had to develop a new theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. In this theory, gravity is not a force that attracts objects, but the result of the curvature of space-time due to the presence of matter. So if we take a look at the solar system, planets will orbit the sun because the sun's mass curves space-time, causing them to move along curved paths rather than straight lines. But since the presence of mass is curving space-time, which mass are we talking about? Well, it turns out that the mass that curves space-time is the total energy contained in the object, which is E over C squared. So this fits the inertial mass definition. And to be clear, when I say something has a gravitational mass, this is not referring to the orbiting objects, this is referring to the object that is causing the curvature in space-time. So in this case, this would be the mass of the sun, not the mass of, say, Jupiter or some other planet. To be more specific, the gravitational mass is the mass that is inferred by looking at orbital motion of objects around it. So if we were to take a look at a planet moving around the sun, we could infer the mass of the sun from that planet's orbit. And that, it turns out, is equal to the total energy of the sun divided by c squared. And this is not equal to the rest mass. In fact, the difference between the rest mass and the total energy, or the gravitational mass, is defined as the binding energy of the star, 
meaning the difference between those two masses is the amount of energy you'd have to put into the star to disassociate it or blow it up. Now, if you've been paying attention, this finding has an implication, which is that light or photons must have a gravitational field because they have energy. Or more precisely, photons contribute to the curvature of space-time. And it's not limited to photons. Any form of energy contributes to the curvature of space-time. So when we're adding up all of the energy of the sun to get its gravitational mass, we include the rest mass, we include energy stored in photons in the sun, we include energy coming from rotation, we include thermal energy, and we include nuclear binding energy, which turns out is negative. But what's important is that all forms of energy have to be included in order to get the gravitational mass. So it turns out that the gravitational mass is still equal to the inertial mass. However, this time, it's not experimental, it's theoretical. And that's because we cannot measure the rest mass of a star. We can measure the gravitational mass by looking at orbiting objects around it, but the rest mass, there's only two ways to get it. You either have to somehow count up all of the individual particles in the sun and then multiply by the rest mass, which is not doable, or you have to have measured it prior to it forming a star meaning you have to measure the mass of the cloud that will eventually collapse and form into a star. But that can take millions, if not billions of years, and we don't have time to do that. So there you have it. This never-ending debate of whether or not photons have mass or light has mass really just comes down to semantics. What do you mean by mass? Do you mean rest mass or do you mean inertial mass or possibly gravitational mass? So hopefully this has resolved this issue for you. Now, in my experience, many people in the photons or massless particles camp are not convinced by this resolution. They stand firm that there's only one kind of mass that matters, and that's rest mass. And they have a point. The other kind is just energy divided by c squared. So why don't we just call it energy? Well, in special relativity, for inertial mass, that's what we do. But for some reason, when dealing with gravity, because the term mass has historically been so tied to the theory of gravity, we still say mass when really we should say energy. Whether you like this resolution or not, it is still very common for people to use mass and energy interchangeably, so you should at least be aware of this so that you know what other people are talking about. If you're still not convinced that light has inertial mass despite not having any rest mass, in my next video, I will go over Einstein's proof that light has inertial mass, which is also his derivation of the equation E equals mc squared or as he derived it originally, m equals e over c squared, m being the inertial mass of a photon. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell to be notified for the release of future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.